Shabbat Shalom. Good morning and welcome. One more time, Shabbat Shalom. Good to see everybody this morning. Today is the second day of Shavuot, and our parasha readings reflect that this week with some traditional readings and some understanding. So the summary of the content of the second day of Shavuot comes from uh, Deuteronomy. The children of Israel camp outside Mount Sinai where they are told that God has chosen them to be his kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The people respond by proclaiming all that God has spoken, we shall do. On the sixth day of the third month, seven weeks after Exodus, the entire nation of Israel assembles at the foot of Mount Sinai and God descends on the mountain amidst the thunder, the lightning, the billows, and the smoke. God proclaimed the Ten Commandments, commanding the people of Israel to believe in God, not to worship idols or take God's name in vain, to keep the Shabbat, honor their parents, not to murder, not to commit adultery, not to steal, not to bear false witness, and to covet other people's property. The people cry out to Moses that the revelation is too intense for them to bear, begging them to receive the Torah from God on their behalf. On the second day of Shavuot, we read it from Deuteronomy chapters 14 through 16, which detail the laws of the three pilgrim feasts of the Jewish people, of Pesach, of Shavuot, and of Sukkot, on which all Jews came to see to be seen and to be before the face of God. The Haftor is the first day of Shavuot readings come from Ezekiel and is Ezekiel's vision of the chariot, reminiscent of the revelation experienced by the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. The prophet Ezekiel relays the vision he had of a chariot led by four creatures that resemble men and describes their physical appearance and actions in detail. When they, the living beings, would go, the wheels would go. And when they would stand, the wheels would stand. And when they would lift themselves up from the ground, the wheels would lift themselves up accordingly. For the will of the living being was in the wheels. And like the appearance of the rainbow that is in the cloud on the rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness around about. That was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when he saw, he saw, he fell on his face and he heard the voice speaking. The Haftor of the second day of Shavuot is more focused on the prophecy of Habakkuk. The prophet recalls the wonders that God had done for Israel at the time of the giving of the Torah at Sinai. He also speaks of the punishment God melted out of their enemies. The Haftor portion then comes from Acts 2, verses 2 through 21. Sections of that says, Then they appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Later on in the chapter, it says, Peter, standing up with eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservants and my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Amen. Amen. Shofarim. Our most glorious, praiseworthy Abba Father. Lord, we come before you today, first of all, asking for your forgiveness for all our many sins. We are such an imperfect people. We can only praise you that you've called those that you have chosen to call Lord, we thank you. We glorify your name. Lord, on this Shavuot, a time when we remember all that you've done, Lord, we thank you that your spirit indwells your people, 
that your spirit is with us, whether we're in a group or whether we're hiding in our cave. Lord, your spirit is with us. And Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we live in a time where we can have your word, your word that is total truth. And Lord, we seek you, your truth. Abba, Father, we give ourselves to you, full of our imperfections, full of our unworthiness, Lord. But we are so thankful and grateful. We ask that your spirit would help us to open our ears and our eyes to you, Lord. That we could see and we could hear and follow your path for each one of us. Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor and our complete and whole heart today in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. For how lovely the tents of Jacob and the dwelling places of Israel. Therefore, with joy, we shall draw water from the wells of Yeshua. Amen. You may be seated. All right, Shabbat Shalom. Right, we begin this door with the Baruch Baruch Adonai Hamvarach. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'elam Vayed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout the generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Blessing Mashiach Yeshua together. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu ederech hayeshua, b'mashiach Yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation, and Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Okay, I'll stand for the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai 
Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. They have to add Adonai Lohecha, Bocholavavkov, Konashakov, Kumadaka. Vahayu had Vrim Ha'ele, a share Anukim at Zavkayom, Al of Aveka. Vashina Tanlevenaka with the Bartabam, Bishiftaka Beveteka, Uletgava Derek, Ushapko of Kumeka, Ukshatam Liot Ayadeka, Vahilot of Ben and Neka, Utatam as Zot Beteka. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The hafta, the riacha, kamoka, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Yitzchak, and God of Yaakov, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God who bestows grace and creates all and remembers the kindnesses, kindnesses of the fathers and brings a redeemer to the children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Abraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord, the resurrector of the dead are you, abundantly able to save, who sustains the living with kindness, resurrects the dead with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those asleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? Our God and God of our fathers, may you be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us in your commandments and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy us from your goodness and make us rejoice in your salvation. And purify our hearts to serve you in truth. In love and favor, O Lord our God, grant us a holy Shabbat as a heritage of Israel, who sanctifies your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, mekadesh ha-Shabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. May he, assess, may he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and all say, Amen. Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is He, though He be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and all say, Amen. May you make peace in His high places, make peace upon us and upon all Israel. Say, Amen. Yitkadav Yitkadashimerabam. 
Ramadi Virkut, Yamik Makute, Bakai Kon of Yomakon of Kai de Gol, Bet Israel, Bagalav with Man Kri Vimru Yesh Mirabba, Mevrak, Lealam, Ome, Amaya Yit Barak, Vishtapak, Vit Pra Avert Mamam, Vietna Save at the Dar, Vit the Lave at the Lal, Shmer Kudushabri Hu Lealam in Korbakata, Vishrata Tushpekata, Venek Mata Damra, Bama, Vimru. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Oh, say shalom bim ramah, huia say shalom aleinu, ve'acho Yisrael, vimru, imru, amen. Oh, say shalom bim Shalom Aleinu Ve'acho Yisrael Vimru Imru Amen Yase Shalom Yase Shalom Shalom Aleinu Ve'acho Yisrael Shalom, Shalom, May he who makes peace in high places make peace for Israel and for all mankind and say, Amen.
God, that you bring to light everything that is hidden. Thank you, God, that your ways are higher than ours, that your thoughts are so much better than ours, oh God. Today, we do surrender to you, God, every part of us, everything that we are, Lord, we lay down on the throne, Lord, we just surrender everything. We give it to you, God, because we want you, God, to be the one who takes control of our lives. We want you to be the one who reigns in our hearts and in our lives. Thank you, God, for Yeshua, Lord, that through him, through his sacrifice, Lord, we can be made whole, that we can be found righteous because of the blood that was poured out on the altar in heaven. God, we stand today as your people, as one people, wanting to know more, wanting to understand your truth. I thank you, God, for this place, Lord, that you have made that you've called us here, God. Continue to do a good work in this people, oh God. Continue to purge and refine us and make us pure and holy as you are holy. Thank you, Lord, for, thank you, Lord, for your word that came forth today. Thank you for your presence, for your glory that is resting in this place. We love you so much, God, and we just bless you and worship you, and we just give everything that we are to you, oh God. In Yeshua's name we pray. shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Yamod Yuel ben Avraham la Torah. Baruch et Adonai hamvarach, Baruch Adonai hamvarach le'olam vayen. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher b'kar b'no mikol ha'amim, b'natan lanu et Torah Baruch Adonai Noten Ha Torah. 
Bless the Lord, the blessed one. Blessed is the Lord, the blessed one, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Yeladim. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu to already met vachaye olam natah bekotenu Baruch atah Adonai notain hatara Blessed are you O Lord our God King of the universe who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us Blessed are you Lord giver of the Torah Vizot ha Torah asher asher sam Sam Moshe, Lifne Bene Israel, Al Pi Adonai Biad Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God, and Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
God's word is written on lambskin, and Yeshua is this lamb. In John 12, 32, Yeshua said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitz Chaim, or Tree of Life. Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Eitz Chaim Hi Lamaka Zakimba. Betonke Mushar Darke Darke Noam Vekol Nativo Teha Shalom Hashavenu Adonai Alecha Veneshuva Kagadesh Yemenu Kakadem. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Revelation 2 7 reads. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, he is, and he shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat shalom, everyone. So for those of you who are with us on um, Thursday night uh, for our Shavuot service, I hope it was a meaningful and impactful time of worship for each and every one of you that you felt the Lord's presence, that you were moved in the spirit, and that God spoke to you. And I know it was a very nice, I know, especially with the Talpio being up here and singing. Um, that, that was a um, really special time. And as we look back on this past Thursday night, but also when we look forward to other times we gather together to come into God's presence, whether it be the weekly Shabbat or if it be during the annual feasts, I hope that everyone, again, like the thing about last Thursday, everyone truly did come prepared. What I mean by that is that you brought your first and your best on that night. You brought a focus that put, was putting God first. You were putting aside all the other things and cares that you the burdens that you carry each and every week, each and every day as you just go through your life. That you put those aside and you really did focus, your focus was centered on God first. I hope you brought your best attitude. That you came in expecting for God to move. You were expecting to come into God's presence. Amen. That you had the best ex expectations. That you came in and it's like, not that, you know, well, Shavuot service, you know, just kind of the routine is what we do. We come together, we worship God, we have a praise and worship service. Um, you know, there's some readings we go through, just kind of going through the motions. But no, that you came with your best expectations. You, again, you expected to enter into the presence of God and to see the Spirit move. Now, why am I emphasizing this? Why am I bringing this? Why am I bringing up now? Because this could have been a good teaching before, but, you know, why bring up this emphasis on bringing our best selves when we come before God and making God our first priority? Well, just using, I could use any of the commandments around the feasts, around any of the feasts, but since we're just passed through Shavuot, thought I would use these. But we see in the commandments when we go to the Torah, 
that God expects his people to provide their first and their best. We're to give our best, our first, to him. Because that should be a reflection of our desire to be with him, to be speaking to him, to hear from him, to be present with him. So if we look, look at Shavuot here, so you know, if we see the command of Shavuot, do they talk about bringing your first and your best? Well, they actually do. We see that, you know, remember Shavuot's a wheat harvest? And we see in the commandments of Leviticus 23, 15 through 20, the following. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Shabbats shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat. Then you shall offer new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves in, of ten, two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year, without blemish, one young bull, and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord, with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats, as a sin offering, and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of a peace offering. The priests shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. So we see here that there's a mention twice that these leaven breads that were supposed to make, that one was to make, and then bring before the Lord and wave before him, that it comes from the first fruits. And the idea is that bef when this is the time of the wheat harvest in Israel. And before you would eat of that harvest, before you would take of the bounty to eat, feed yourself, you would make this offering before the Lord, that the first fruits of it would go to him. And we see that in the sacrifices, that there were to be the sacrifice of lambs that went along with this, and two rams from the herd. And it says, without blemish, because it was to be the very best. The first and the best are to be given to the Lord. Again, this is just isn't Shavuot, any of the annual feasts. You look at any of the commandments and the sacrifices that went along with them, they all talk about the first fruits of that harvest and always animals without blemish, the best. They're to be given to God. And actually, when you look at the entire sacrificial system that God set up in the Tanakh, in, um, in, his to in the Torah, we see that underlining all this is always this principle of giving the first and the best. And the reason being is because we've been given everything by God. And therefore, whether it be in the sacrifices, but it, think about it today, it could be our material possessions, it could be our talents, it's our time, it's our attention, our attention that we give to God. It should be our first and our best. And we do so because we, we're doing it out of love and we're doing it out of gratitude, not because we're obligated. Yeah, we should follow the commandments because God said it, but at the heart of it, if you're really fulfilling these commandments, if you're really carrying them out, it's about the heart, and it's about, I want to give God the best. I want to give him the first, because of everything he's already done for me. Now, this principle is found in Torah right near the beginning of it. One of the very early first accounts we have of human history from Torah, we see this principle being laid out. We read about it, actually, in the story of Cain and Abel. In Genesis 4, 3 through 5, we hear the following. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, when we hear the story of Cain and Abel, the, the, you know, the typical question that comes first to someone's mind is, of course, well, why did God accept Abel's sacrifice and he rejected Cain's? 
What's the difference? What's the difference between the two sacrifices that causes God to respond differently in terms of accepting them? Because it does say they both, they both brought forth part of their harvest, part of their plenty. They brought to the Lord and they gave as an offering. So what really is this difference? Well, it's seen in the type of offering. And specifically, we're given some clues here about Abel's offering and why it was so pleasing to the Lord. So first of all, we read, as was just said, Abel brought for, forth the firstborn of the flock. His very first. The first thing he received from God, because obviously Abel had nothing to do with the, the sheep, the sheep um, producing lambs. God gave it to him. He brings that, first, that firstborn of the flock, and he gives it before the Lord. Before he would reap any benefit, whether it be shearing the wool of the lambs, whether it would be um, butchering the lamb and then eating of the meat, before he did anything of that, of that sort of his flock, he gave the first to God. But then we have this phrase here also that says, firstborn of the flock and of their fat. Now, what does that mean? What's that mean saying of the fat? And the key to understanding is we have to look at the Hebrew word that's being translated here for fat. And the Hebrew word is chalev. Now, while chalev does refer to, at times, fat as we think about it, the, the, specifically the abdominal fat that's found around sheep and cattle and goats, it actually has a much broader meaning than this. And it means to bring the best, to bring the finest, the most excellent part of something. And we actually, when you go to the JPS, the, the, the common translation that's used among the Jews of this verse of 4.4, it reads, and Abel for his part brought the choicest of the firstlings of his flock. So instead of saying of the fat, he's saying the choicest. So meaning and demonstrating this word chalev, what it means, not only did Abel bring the firstborn, so he, you know, he has his first lambs that are ever born, not only does he bring the firstborn, but the very best among the firstborn he brought to God. And this is why God accepts the offering. And so we're really going to focus for a while here on this idea of chalev, the, the best being brought to God. And I do quickly, in passing, want to point out, just give another example of how we can see chalev refers to some, can refer to more than just the physical fat on the animal. And that, again, it's the choices or it's the best parts. An example of this we get in Genesis 45, 17 through 18, when we hear Pharaoh promising the following to Joseph and his family. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart. Go to the land of Canaan, bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. So of course when we read the fat of the land, we understand this is an idiomatic phrase. It doesn't mean that there's literal fat coming from the land. Um, but instead it's saying it's given a chalev of the land. Meaning that Joseph would receive not just, you know, you may read that the fat of the land and just think, well, that's just the produce. It's the bounty of the land. But it's, it's much more than that. It's actually saying whatever is the best that the land produces is what would go to Joseph and his family. Similarly, we see language being used in the book of Numbers. In Numbers 18, 12, where God promises Aaron and his descendants the following. All the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and the grain, their first fruits, which they offer to the Lord, I have given them to you. So here we see chalev of the oil and the chalev of the new wine and the grain being given to the Aaronic priesthood. And this was the payment for their services in the tabernacle. Now translators, translators often don't use the word fat here because it makes no sense to say the fat of the olive oil or the fat of the wine press or the fat of grain. So instead, they translate in what we would expect in English to, re um, to reflect that the priest would receive the best and the finest parts of the harvest. Now, I'm going through all, taking all this time to define chalev so that when we encounter commandments regarding it in Leviticus, we can understand both its application in the sacrificial system, but then also we can then begin to apply it in our spiritual walk with Yeshua. For within the instructions regarding the five types of korban, the, the five types of offerings that are laid out in Leviticus, we find the following commandment in Leviticus 7, 22 through 25. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, 
Speak to the children of Israel, saying, You shall not eat any fat of ox or sheep or goat, and the fat of an animal that dies naturally, and the fat of what is torn by wild beasts may be used in any other way, but you shall by no means eat it. For whoever eats the fat of the animal of which men offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, the person who eats it shall be cut off from his people. These verses here make it clear that it's forbidden for any Israelite to eat the halab, to eat the fat of an animal that not only is being offered to God, but which has or had the potential to be offered to God. Now before we go into the full significance of that, I do want to make a couple notes here to understand what it means here by the word fat. Because actually here now it is talking about the fat on an animal, the fat that is attached to meat. It says you're not to eat the halev of cattle, oxen, um, to eat it of sheep or of goats. And these are the animals, of course, that were typically used in the different um, offerings. The burnt, the peace, the sin, and the guilt offering all had these animals being used. But it doesn't forbid eating of fat from other animals. Kosher birds, um, deer, anything that would be kosher that isn't used in the sacrifices, it's not forbidding that. Also realize, halev only refers, when we're talking about actual fat, physical fat, it refers to certain types, it refers to a certain type of fat on the animal. It's not all fat that's found throughout them. So if you're eating a piece of meat um, and it has a little bit of fat on it, you're probably okay. And the reason being is the halev is specifically those thick layers of fat that's found in the abdominal area. Other types of fat, the kind of fat you may find with, attached to other pieces of meat, is actually has a different Hebrew word. It's known as shuman in Hebrew. But the halev, like I said, refers to the thick layers of fat that are found around specifically the kidneys, the liver, the digestive organs, and the tail. And we know that it's referring to these specific abdominal layers of fat when we read about it in Torah because of what we read in Leviticus 3, 14 through 17. Then he shall offer from, its, from his offering as an offering made by fire to the Lord, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys he shall remove. And the priests shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. This shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat or blood. Now, the specific sacrifice being discussed here in this passage is the peace offering. But every other sacrifice requires the halev as well to be placed on the altar and burned because it belongs uniquely to God. It's true of the peace offering, but also the sin and the guilt offerings, where we see that these particular organs and the fat that surrounds them is placed on the altar, burnt to God. We also see it in the burnt offering, where the entire animal is placed on the sacrificial fire and is given to God. Now, the commandment forbidding the eating of the halev is not just in regards to sacrifices, though. Like I said, it actually is in regards to the consumption of it from a cow, a sheep, or a goat, these animals that would be used in the sacrifices, um, regardless of whether or not it was actually being part of the sacrifice. It even, the, the, the commandments even go so far as to forbid eating it from animals that would have been unkosher anyway such as those, and I don't mean like unkosher because it's a pig, I mean it's, again, a cow, a sheep, or a goat that becomes unkosher, primarily because of the way it died. So if the animal died of disease, or if it died because it was torn apart by a pack of wild dogs or something, all of a sudden that meat's unkosher, you can't eat it. It does say, though, that this fat can be used, can be used because perhaps as a lubricant, can be used to make candles and other things, but because the fat of those animals is holy, it belongs exclusively to God. So even when this animal that was clean becomes unclean, it, it dies in a way that's, because it died in a way that's not prescribed by God for the killing of animals, then you're not to use it as food, you can't use it for that because... It's it, because it belongs to God. 
Now, once we understand all of this, we still have to ask, why does God forbid the Israelites from eating this, though? Why does God reserve it for himself? Why is the Kalev a problem of eating it? Well, part of the answer should be obvious at this point, because, again, Halevs do meet dull meaning. It's fat, but it also means the best. It means the choicest. Now, why would the fat of an animal be considered the best part of it? It sounds kind of strange to us today. In our modern times, where we are consumed about how much fat we actually do consume, and we see fat as being unhealthy, and oftentimes we're cutting away the fat from meat because we don't want to eat it. But in an agrarian society in the ancient times, in the Middle East there, it's very understandable because that fat was the best thing. That was the desired thing to be, eat, to be eaten. Because first of all, you have to realize just how bland the daily diet of the ancient Israelites was compared to us. They didn't have processed or refined sugar. They didn't have cornstarch and artificial flavorings and foods like we do. Likewise, eating meat was a rare thing. It's not every, unless you decided to, be, to choose vegetarianism, every one of us almost eats meat on a, basically a daily basis. This is not what the ancient diet was like. The idea uh, of eating meat every day would be foreign to them. Therefore, when they did have that rare treat of eating it, and when I, when I say rare, they may have eaten meat maybe once or twice a month. That's maximum that they would have had it. So when they're eating the, the fat, this would provide a savory, sweet flavor to it. It was highly desired. In addition, the fat of the animal would have been one of the best sources of energy that they would have known in their diet. Because again, when your diet primarily consists, your daily diet consists just of eating bread and grains, that fat all of a sudden becomes something, it's almost like what we would think of as like a really sweet dessert or a candy or ice cream or something. That's what that fat was to them. And so they, it was desired, it was considered the best part. And so when you consider this, you understand why it was desired as the best and why therefore it was reserved for God. Now we also see in the Tanakh that the sacrifices made to God went up to him with a pleasing or a sweet odor. Such as we, again, so these sacrifices have that fat in it. And that's that sweet, pleasing odor that would go up to them as we see in Leviticus 1 through 9. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Now this sweet the sweet aroma was likely a physical attribute of burning the sacrifice and the fat on it. I don't know if you've ever smelled the burning of flesh of animals. It's not necessarily the most, we think of where we're cooking the roast, we're cooking it in our kitchens. No, you burn an actual animal. Um, I experienced this back in um, summer of 2001. I was over in England for the summer and that was when there was a hoof and mouth um, uh, pandemic that hit the animals. And they were literally slaughtering tens of thousands of animals, like sheep and so on, a week. And they, you could smell it um, when you went out into the countryside. You could just smell the burned carcasses. It wasn't a pleasant smell. But when you're, so when you're in making the sacrifices in the altar, though, the fat, though, when it burns, does create this sweet, savory sense. And so that's what's raising up to God in this. Now, when considering the fat that's forbidden, specifically that which surrounds the abdominal organs of the kidneys, the digestive organs, the liver, as I mentioned, you have to wonder, is there a, is there a spiritual significance to it as well? What, is that part of what also makes it the choice portion of the sacrifice to God? Now, you may recall a teaching I did years ago, if, you are a mem if you've been a longtime member, about the importance of these organs in the ancient Semitic world. Because these were considered the organs where the, the innermost thoughts resided, where the passions resided, where moral decision-making actually resided. And today we think moral decision-making, well, that occurs in the brain. The ancient world didn't see it that way. They saw it as occurring in the heart and in the kidneys, actually. And in, in that teaching, I showed you at least 12 instances in the Tanakh where modern translators refer to a person's mind or they refer to a person's motive, but when you actually read it in the Hebrew, it actually is talking about the kidneys. One example of this is found in Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. 
The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Again, it says, reading in the English, it says, he tests the heart and he tests the mind. But if you're reading it in Hebrew, it says, yes, he tests the heart, but he also, it doesn't say he tests the mind, it doesn't say he tests the brain, it actually says he tests the kidneys. So what's that all about? Well, again, Speaking to the people of that time, God says he tests the kidneys because they believed the kidneys was with where one's motives and their passions resided. And ultimately, their decision-making, whether you were going to choose the Yetzer Hara or the Yetzer Hatov, the good inclination or the bad inclination, when you were confronted with a decision, they saw it. Where does that occur in you? They saw it as occurring in the kidneys. Therefore, and I'll admit, this is primarily me, my own thinking here, but perhaps it's possible God claimed these organs as belonging to him in the sacrifices. Because, yeah, the fat surrounded them, but also because God was showing your thoughts, your passions belong to me. Now certainly giving our thoughts, motives, and emotions is what God requires of us. Likewise, God expects that we give him the best of ourselves and the first fruits of ourselves. After all, this is what's behind the commandments that we recite every Shabbat that are found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and so talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In these words, we see that God requires everything from us. He commands us to love him with every part of our being and to, be the very be and to the very best of our ability. It's not enough to simply love him with our heart, meaning your intellect and your affections, and with your soul, meaning your true self, your true identity beyond the flesh in which your soul resides, but we are to do it with all of our might. We are to put great effort into loving God. We are to give him our very best. It's not enough to do the bare minimum with God. We are to give him our very best. We're to, we're to do we're to do everything we can for him. If we're not, then we've not really made an offering to him of the parts he's claimed. We're not truly committing ourselves to him. If we take this commandment seriously, its standard is likely to convict every one of us. So the passage we just read, and that we recite every week, and oftentimes I know when you're going through the liturgy, you're just reciting the words. It's human nature. It's something we do every week. It becomes routine. We can say it without thinking about it. Notice, however, whenever someone who's leading it trips up in the words, all of a sudden everyone trips up in the words because you're just going through it. You're not really focused on it. But we really should be focused on that because what that commandment is telling us is that we're going to give everything. And if you're not, when you're reciting those words, it really should be convicting you. Because very few of us consistently put as much thought, energy, and time into serving God as we do the other pursuits in our lives. Whether they be pursuits of relationships with our spouses, our family, and our friends, our pursuit of raising our children to eventually be self-sufficient, successful, and moral adults, our pursuit of education and self-improvement, our pursuit of material security for ourselves and our family. We cannot say we are fulfilling the commandments to love God with our whole being to our greatest extent if we're investing more time and energy in those other pursuits. Now, I mentioned these four, these four specific pursuits, relationships, rearing children, self-improvement, and material security, because they can be morally good things. I'm not saying it's wrong to pursue those things. But we have to make the effort to place God above and before all of them. Is it, it's easy to see, although not always easy to correct, how much time we waste on fun or self-indulgent activities. Okay, yeah, we, it's easy to see when we 
did not give time to God because we decided to go watch and play sports. We decided to waste time on social media. We decided to shop for things that we really didn't need. We decided to just veg out in front of the television. That's easy to notice. But when it comes to the positive pursuits of our lives, one that can make a contribution to the community, to our family, to the society, it can be difficult to see how we are actually still maybe failing to give God our first and our best because we may be doing it in these other areas. And this is where I think the offerings are beneficial in instructing us and why, again, you know, it's common people that aren't raised in Judaism or Messianic Judaism, they want to just skip over Leviticus because they don't see the value in it. I guarantee you if you did a poll of Christians and you said, of the five books of Torah, which one is, do you like the least? Or which one do you read the least? Maybe that's a better way to say because no one would want to admit, a true Christian would not want to admit that there's a part of God's word they don't like. But they would say, which one do you read the least? Which one do you see the most as the least influential or important in your life? I guarantee you Leviticus is probably going to be the most common answer. But there is importance here because the offerings, they instruct us on how to fulfill what Yeshua called the greatest commandment. Because in showing us that God requires our first fruits, he requires our chalev, not just the fat of the named animals, but the very best parts of all we bring close to him. We see that what belongs to God should be mixed in everything that we do. As an agrarian society, the Israelites were expected to give to God the first and the best of what they produced. With this in mind, their primary pursuits would always be linked to God, since when they were working for themselves, such as tending the flock, planting a field, and then reaping the harvest from it, they were also working for God because if they were following the commandments, they knew the first part and the best part they weren't going to keep, and they weren't going to go sell to make money. They were going to give it to God. And in fact, what were they doing? They were working for him first, because the first was expected to go to him. Likewise, we should be giving God the first and the best in everything that we do. So it's, for, think about it. As we build and foster relationships, we should be thinking of what we, of what we will give to God while doing that. So when we foster and build relationships, do we share or do we teach the gospel and Torah? in our relationships, whether it be through words or maybe even more importantly through our actions. For example, whether it be the workplace, whether it be a local hangout, wherever it might be, if there's other people there, they're partaking in gossip, because most people have a guilty pleasure to participate in gossip. Do you, because you put God first, refuse to engage in it because it shows a lack of love for your neighbor? As you raise your children, whether they are actually your own children that you're raising or they're in the community and you're helping to raise, you give time to help raise that next generation. We should be thinking of what will we give to God when we're doing that. Do we raise up the children in God's word by talking with them about it, including the difficult questions that might arise? And more importantly, do we role model a life that's committed to serving God, to following the Mashiach? For example... Do we push our children to succeed so that we can live our lives through them or we can show them off as a badge of honor and our parenting skills? Or do we push them to succeed so that they will be self-sufficient and walk with God on their own accord after we're gone? As we work towards self-improvement, we should be thinking of what will we give to God? Do we work to improve ourselves, whether it be the development of a skill set or our physical health? so that we can better serve the kingdom of God? For example, do we seek after additional degrees, certifications, titles, so that we can boost our ego or, fe our ego or feel superior to others? Or do we seek to advance our intellect and our various skill sets so that they can more effectively be used to make positive impacts, whether, again, it's sharing the good news, it's, it's, it's evangelizing, it's sharing the gospel, or maybe making positive impacts in other individuals' lives. As we seek material security, we should be thinking of what we will give to God. Do we, provide, do we work to provide for ourselves so that we're not a burden on anyone else? 
as well as work to support and care for our family and then those in need of our community? So for example, do we pursue prosperity so that we can indulge in our passions, whether they be small things like making frequent trips to Sweet Frog or the local watering hole, or they be large like things like traveling to foreign countries for, the, for, for pleasure or purchasing high-priced status symbols in order to keep up appearances? Is that why we do it? Or do we pursue material well-being so that we can meet the needs of our family and then our community and that we also are not a burden to others? These are the types of questions each of us should be asking ourselves in seeking to give God our first and our best in all things. And only by making a conscious effort to make sure God is in all things that we do will we ever begin to come close to meeting this standard to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength. It's why we need to make sure that his word is with us at all times. That it is present in our conversations when we are at home with our family and our closest friends. Or when we're out and about running errands or enjoying a day off from work. It needs to be with us from the time that we wake in the morning until we lay down at night. It needs to be at the forefront of our thoughts. That means being put it between the front of your eyes. It needs to be with us in guiding our actions throughout the day, meaning it should be on our hands. There should be no departmentalizing our activities as, to, as if to say, okay, this amount of time is for God, but then I need to separate, I need this separate time for myself or for my work that I need to accomplish. Instead, we need to seek how we can include God in everything we do and make sure we are bringing our first and our best near to God. In conclusion, I want to look and what Paul wrote in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians about how he gave his best to God and the work that he did and how he encouraged others to do the same. In the chapter, Paul discusses how he denies himself the wages he rightfully deserves as an apostle, a messenger of the Mashiach, and he does so in order to make sure nothing will hinder his message of the good news. In stressing his self-sacrifice, he gives three arguments as to why he could rightfully claim a wage for his service as an apostle. First, he makes an appeal to reason, that one who works deserves simply to be paid for it. If you do work, you should get paid. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11 states, Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? So Paul contends that as an apostle, he deserved to be paid for his work. Since he carried forth a message that was not his own, but rather he spoke for another under the authority of that other person, he deserved a wage for his time and effort. And he says, after all, don't those who plant a garden or tend to a flock get to eat or drink from the benefits of their labor? He even shows how the Torah commands that the ox, when they're treading the grain, that they should receive, even the ox should receive a reward by being able to eat from the grain upon which they're walking and standing as they're doing the work. Paul then goes on to compare himself to the Levites and the priests who worked around and in the tabernacle and received a wage for their service. He states in 1 Corinthians 9.13, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the temple partake of the offerings of the altar? The priests who administered the sacrifices received a portion of them, depending on which, what type of sacrifice was being made. Although they received nothing from the burnt offering, which was given entirely to God by the sacrificial fire, the priests received a significant portion of the grain offering, the breast and the right thigh of the peace offerings, the entire animal other than the fat, the kidneys and the liver, the guilt offerings and the silt offerings. So they received things for their work. They also received a portion of other types of offerings made to God by the Israelites, which extended beyond the five Corbin listed in the first seven chapters of Levit Leviticus. 
Likewise, the Levites received a payment for their work around the tabernacle, which consisted of the tithes that the Israelites brought to God from their bounty. Interestingly, the Levites then had to tie the tenth of what they received. So the Levites, they receive a tenth from all the Israelites, but then they had to give a tenth and the best tenth of what they received then to the priests. <clears throat> because they as well were required to give the kalev of the tithe that they received. This was all outlined in Numbers 18. Now finally, Paul declares that he also had a right to a wage by the instruction of Yeshua for preaching the gospel. He states in 1 Corinthians 9.14, even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Now, what Paul's likely, most likely referring to there is Yeshua's instructions when he sent the 70 out to proclaim, that the, to proclaim the kingdom of God had come. The instruction is found in Luke 10, 7 through 8. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. So Paul, three arguments he, he lays right out front. Yeah, I should receive a, I, I could receive a wage. I'd be entitled, essentially, to a wage because, A, I'm doing work for someone else. B, we have the example of the Levites and the priests who were doing work for God. I'm doing work for God. They got a wage. And third, that Yeshua said that those who minister the gospel should live from the, from the gospel. But having established the right to receive a wage from his laborers, laborers, Paul then shares why he does not ask for one. And he actually denies it from anyone who would offer it to him. 1 Corinthians 9, 15 through 19 tells us. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if, I, but if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Messiah without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. So why has Paul denied himself a wage that he rightfully deserves by serving God? It's because he is striving to give the very best to God. Paul has made himself a servant to all men so that nothing will interfere with his preaching of the gospel. He explains in this passage that even if he did not want to preach the message, he would still be responsible for doing so because th that is the office or the responsibility that God has placed on him. One can easily imagine Paul's guilt for persecuting the followers of the Mashiach until Yeshua confronted him on the road to Damascus. And we could see that if that's what you lived in your past you can kind of understand why he would refuse then a wage um, for his apostleship. Paul, more than most, knew the path of destruction he had been upon until he was rescued by the direct intervention of Yeshua in his life. Thus, it's easy to understand why Paul felt the privilege of preaching the gospel was the only reward that he actually needed. Having been redeemed from destruction, Paul knew that he needed to give his first, his best, and really everything to God. Reading Paul from this perspective, we can then understand why he concludes this section with the following encouragement in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should obtain, become disqualified. It's not enough for us to merely participate in the race but we should run it with the mindset that we have to do everything we can to win it. 
We shouldn't approach our walk with God as merely one of several priorities to us because at the end of the day, we will all get a participation ribbon or a trophy. Instead, we must prioritize our relationship with him so that it directs and informs every consideration that we make in life. Using the analogy of preparing for a race, think about how, you appro how your approach would be different if you were to participate in a 10K marathon, or a 10K run, and the only goal was simply, I want to finish the 10K, and that can be a good goal. For me, that'd be a great goal, because I'd have a lot of work to get there. Now, what, what would you need to do, though? You would have to start training for it, and you'd probably maybe start several months in advance. Again, maybe for someone like me, you start a year in advance. But you would do this by how? Well, you'd set aside time each week to condition yourself for running that distance. You might have to change your diet so you can lose some weight during that time. You might have to adjust several other patterns in your life to, you know, to reserve that time to begin conditioning for it. But at the end of the day, the changes to your life would be temporary because you're just thinking, I'm just running a race. And I just want to, you know, I got a goal in mind. I want to be able to finish it. But it's not going to consume you, the, the time that you need to do that, to, you, you know, all of your time and all of your efforts. But what if the goal is not merely to just participate and finish it, but it's actually to win the 10K run? And there's other people who run them all the time that are participating in it. You're going to have to approach it very differently. Everything in your life would have to become centered around that one goal. Conditioning and practice would become the primary focus of your life. Your decision on diet, sleeping patterns, exercise routines outside of just running, the mental focus, it would all be dictated each and every day by that goal that I want to win that 10K run. Because the goal demands your, your very first and your very best, every decision and action you would make would be informed by that question of how does, one, how does this help me win that race? Thus, in using this analogy, Paul is saying that we must approach our walk with God and our calling to serve him in whatever capacity that is with the same mentality and effort. We're going for that crown. We're going for that laurel. We give God our first and our best when we include him in every decision we make and every action that we take. It's not enough to simply carve out time for him to commit a portion of our day to him. Rather, we must consider the question of how does this serve God or how does this demonstrate love to God in every moment of our day? If we do this, if we make God first in our lives and we give him our very best, then we will be able to approach the end of our days in the same confidence that Paul did when he wrote the following in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. It's our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the lands, and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. And the seat of his glory is in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our king, there is nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, and you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God, in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is none other. Amen. Let's stand together. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. 
the spirit of the sovereign lord come and make your presence known we feel the glory of the living god and let the weight of your glory cover us let the life of your river flow let the truth of your kingdom reign in us let the weight of your glory let the weight of your glory Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. And Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. And let the weight of your glory cover us. And let the life of your river flow. Let the truth of your kingdom reign in us. Let the weight Here I am to worship, here I am to bow. 
The cold air at store, there's none like you, oh God. In all of heaven, Lord, in all of the earth, God, there's none like you. We honor you this day, the Shabbat, the Shabbat. We bless your name. For on this day you gave us the law. On this day you gave Moshe on Har Sinai the law, Father. On this day you filled your people in the book of Acts with the Holy Spirit. Overwhelm them, Lord God. You wash them and clean them from the inside out. They might walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. You seek the things of the Spirit and not the things of the flesh, Lord God. For the flesh is weak. We bless you and we praise you and we magnify you for there's none like you. In all of heaven and all of earth, we stand before a great king. We walk, walk along the path, Father God, that you've laid for each and every one of us. We seek to hear your voice, that you would guide us along the path of righteousness. That every wicked thing within us, Lord God, that you would purge it, that you would cleanse us we might be 
idea, eternal flame for your kingdom. The world around us might smell the essence and fragrance of your glory and your holy presence. We honor you. We bless your name. Yeshua, you are king. Hashem, Yeshua, Mashiach, Amen. Everybody take their seats. One more, we'll have a couple announcements. Oh, no. Okay, okay. All right, a few announcements. Um, again, to um, carry out uh, beyond uh, Shavuot, if anybody do, does, do have offerings and tithes for the Shavuot, um, we're not going to pass around the, the bucket we have in the past, but there's a doc buck in the backs. In the back, you mark in the envelope for Shavuot, and uh, that's how we'll, we'll collect them there. Um, yeshiva this week. Um, Stephen? Very nice. Okay. Got all the meat there. Pretty good. Um, aside from that, uh, just a reminder uh, for Oneg, um, please clean up after yourselves. It was coming out for announcements a couple weeks ago. Uh, just be mindful of the messes and we'll take care of our, you know, this is our house, this is God's house. We're all in our community, so we'll all take care of it together. So that's the way it goes. Um, also, uh, for the visitors, uh, we do have Oneg and Time of Fellowship, and by, by all means, feel free to get the food right, right off the bat. We'll give you first, first dibs for the food, because if you'll find out very soon, all of us get up there and we will annihilate that table, and especially the kids. So please be mindful of visitors. Anybody else, please introduce yourself and uh, go from there. So I think that's it. Any other announcements that I might be missing? No? Okay. I'll say the blessing of the food. So we'll get together, we say, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMotzi Lakemin Haaretz, B'Shem Yeshu HaMashiach, Amen. Shavuot Tov. I know what it is. You know what it is? Ah. Uh.